Well, I was reminded of a story this week, and I went back and found this story. I may have shared this story years ago, but it's a fascinating study they did with a group of uh, uh, grade schoolers uh, where they had them uh, basically out playing on a playground. And uh, what they did was they watched them as they played. There was no fence around this playground. They watched them kind of huddle in the middle of the playground, kind of worried, kind of fearful, not venturing out too far from the play equipment. And then what they did was they took the same playground and put a fence around it. And then they observed those same kids. And those same kids, when the fence went up, they began to fill up that entire yard, that entire space, all the way out to the fence, enjoying the full area that was before them, simply because the fence went up. And so this is, the, uh, this is what they, they, they basically came up with. This was their conclusion. The overwhelming conclusion was, was that with a, with a given limitation, children felt safer to explore a playground. With a boundary, in this case, the fence, the children felt at ease to explore the space. In other words, fences brought freedom. It was the absence of fences that created fear and apprehension. I want to talk today about the boundaries of freedom. And uh, here, here it is on the screen in two different translations, the New Living Translation. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. And the new, uh, the, the English Standard Version uh, for freedom Christ has set us free, stand firm therefore, and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. We're going to walk through this verse today, but here's the question, what does freedom mean to you? When you hear that word freedom, what comes to your mind? And I think if we were to ask probably uh, people throughout the country, I think one of the things people would say was the United States. It's kind of like we have been for 250 years kind of defined by Freedom, if you live within the borders of the United States, you live in a free country. We're defined by, to some degree, our freedom. And the reality is that's what makes it kind of interesting lately as, as uh, sometimes people feel their freedoms being threatened. And sometimes I think people are oblivious to the fact that there are enemies of freedom and that it's possible America someday could lose their freedoms. We could turn out like any other country in the world that didn't have its freedoms, and we kind of tend to take them for granted. But as you look throughout the scriptures, you see some interesting things about freedom. Uh, but Galatians 5, 1, as we see here, one of the things we see in this verse here is that it's God's desire we live in free. For freedom, Christ has set us free. He wants us to live in fr freedom. That is his will. Now think about this. If you go through scripture for a minute, First, God, we have the Garden of Eden, right? And God puts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and the Garden of Eden is a place of freedom. We're going to see that today a little bit. But the reality is everything they would need to live a life of freedom is right there in the Garden of Eden. And then, of course, 2,000 years after that, God comes along and takes Abraham to the promised land and shows him this promised land that is to be his land and it's really a land of freedom. It's intended to be a land of freedom for the Jewish people to enjoy and to thrive in. And then, of course, we know that one day we're looking forward to what? We're citizens of heaven. We're looking forward to going to heaven. And heaven is marked by what? A land of, of great freedom, incredible freedom. And so we see throughout the scripture this idea of living in a place or a land of freedom. But what I want us to understand today and what we want to see in this message today is that our present reality is that we are in Christ just like if you were in the garden or in the promised land or in heaven, if you're in Christ, positionally, you are already free. You are already free. That's the bottom line. And we can paraphrase chapter 5, verse 1 there. We have been set free to live free. That first line, we have been set free to live free. In fact, here's today's big idea. What does freedom mean to you? Okay, let me get clicking here. Today's big idea. We can live in the freedom of Eden in the midst of a fallen world. And all around us, we live in a fallen world, and it's a broken world, and it's a sin-infested planet, but we can live in freedom. The freedom of Eden, we can know that spiritually in the midst of a fallen world. In fact, it's fascinating because look at this verse in Romans chapter 8. Here it talks about this world, how this world is imprisoned because of Adam and Eve's sin. For the creation waits with, with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And so the world itself is imprisoned and longing for the day when it is set free from its corruption. And the reality is we long for that day as well, right? When we leave behind these 
broken down physical bodies and we leave this sin infested planet and we go to heaven to be with Christ. Uh, but the, the truth is we're already living in freedom. We are living in freedom in the midst of this fallen and imprisoned world. Now, what's the significance of this message for us today? I was thinking about that uh, as I was going through this. And I, I get a sense when I read a lot on Facebook these days, you get a lot of sense, you see a lot of comments and a lot of feedback um, that people feel like, well, hey, you know, we're kind of losing our freedoms right now in the United States. There's a lot of things going on that people say, well, that's not constitutional and we're losing our freedoms. And people feel like their freedoms are under attack. And as I thought about that, you know, it's, I think part of it is that some people read through Scripture and yeah, there's a time when there is a cashless society and there's a time when they're going to mark everybody and chip everybody. And so we see hints of these things going on, right? And people are like, hey, this is kind of a little scary. This is kind of like what it says in the you know, book of Revelations. And we're not in the book of Revelations. Don't worry, we're not there. And we're going to be raptured out before that ever comes to be. But some of these things could be introduced and some of these things are out there. There are ideas that are certainly people want to push these ideas. There are certainly people that would love to promote the ideas that you find in the book of Revelations. And they want that control and they want to take away. Certainly there's enemies of freedom today. But here is, I think, the significance of this, of this message today. And there's three ways we can look at it here. Number one, uh, the spiritual freedom we have in Christ as citizens of heaven is a greater treasure than our national freedom in this world. So we can, yeah, we can be worried that maybe we're losing some of our freedoms here in the United States and maybe we are, maybe we aren't. But you know what? Never lose sight of the fact that the greatest freedom we have, the greatest treasure of freedom, and that's what we're talking about today, the treasure of freedom, it's that we are citizens of heaven, that we have a freedom in Christ that we can even experience in this fallen world. Second thing is that nothing can steal our freedom in Christ. So yeah, maybe they can take away some of our freedoms here in, in, in the United States. Maybe there are people that live in communist countries and have lost their freedoms, but if they're in Christ, you know what? They're free. And so nothing can steal our freedom in Christ, and that's the greatest freedom that we can know. And we're going to see the power of that freedom as we come to the end of the message today. We're going to see the power of this freedom, even if we would lose our freedoms. And then number three, we were created to live in and to live out our freedom in Christ. That's it. God created us to live in and to live out the freedom we have in Christ. And he wants us to do that in the midst of this fallen world. So three principles today for knowing freedom in a fallen world. We're going to just walk through 15 verses here, kind of unpacking verse one, but looking at, at the next 14 verses. And, and here's the first thing. Christ has set us free. That's the basic premise. We start right there. Christ has set us free. Past tense. For freedom, Christ has set us free. That's the basic premise. And this basically applies that if you have put your faith and trust in the gospel, if you have believed and received, if you are in Christ, you are free. You are a free person this morning. I don't care if you live in a communist country. I don't care. You know, Paul talks a lot about being a prisoner, right? He was a prisoner. He was locked up in a jail. Paul would tell you, you know what? I'm the freest man on the planet, even when he was sitting in jail. Here's what the first uh, verses tell us, first six verses. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. So here's the context, right? Paul has gone to the church at Galatia and he's taught them about grace, this great new thing called grace based on the cross. And they pretty much, great message, they're accepting it. And then in behind them come these Judaizers who say, well, time out. Yeah, grace is great and Jesus is great, but you need a little Moses too. You need a little bit of the law. Grace on its own is not good enough. You still need some of the law. The reality is you can't mix law and grace. You can't mix Jesus and Moses. You simply can't. Now let's look at the most difficult part of the text though and it's found here in verse 4. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Now what's Paul saying here? 
Is he saying it's possible to fall away from grace, to be severed from Christ, to lose your salvation? Is that what he's saying? Well, we know that doesn't jive with the gospel as a whole. We know that doesn't fit in with the rest of Scripture. So what is Paul saying? Well, there's two potential options here. One option is that Paul is preaching like most pastors preach sometimes to a mixed audience. He's preaching to those who have trusted Christ as their Savior. They're in Christ. They're free. And then he's preaching to some who are on the fence, maybe. They've heard the message of grace. They're debating. No, it could be. And then they're also over here debating the message of Moses and the law and the Judaizers and saying, well, yeah, I don't know. And they're kind of like in the midst and they don't know what to believe and they haven't made their mind up. And Paul says, hey, you are severed from Christ if you would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. <clears throat> that means you're not like those who have been saved by grace. You're on the opposite side of the aisle. And so the first one here would be those individuals who were never saved. That's just speaking to those who have never made a personal decision for Christ. Now, the second option of this verse, you're severed from Christ, you would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Paul here is presenting a reality, uh, presenting a reality in, in a sense uh, that could never be true. He's presenting a reality that could never actually be true. What do I mean by that? Well, let me see uh, how, how to, to, to explain this. Okay, it's a reality that in fact can never be. Paul is saying that if as a Christian, that if as a Christian saved by faith, you are now being justified by law, then you are severed from Christ and you are fallen from grace. If you're a Christian saved by grace, but now you're being justified by the law, you have been severed from Christ and fallen from grace. Here's the question. Can you be justified by the law? Is that even possible? <laughs> well, of course not. You can never be justified by the law. If you've been saved by grace, you can't be justified by the law. You've been justified by Christ. If you're not saved, you can't still be justified by the law. What this is really is you may think in your brain, you might have been saved by grace and now you might be thinking, well, maybe I do need to keep the law. Maybe I do need to be justified by law. And what Paul is basically saying here is that if you could be justified by the law, if that was possible, then you would be severed from Christ and fallen from grace. But that's not even possible. And so it's impossible to be justified by the law and it's impossible if you have been saved by grace to be severed from Christ and to fall from grace and to lose your salvation. That's an impossibility as well. So one of those two options is at play. Individuals who are not living in and living out their freedom in Christ. That, that's the second group. They were saved, but they just weren't living in that reality. They were thinking in their brain, well, I need to keep the law to be justified. And Paul says that is stinking thinking stirred up by those rascally Judaizers. And so... That's the reality. And here's the thing. If you are saved by grace and you begin to think you can be saved by the law or justified by the law, what will happen? Well, you will fail to live in and fail to live out your freedom in Christ. You will simply fail to do that. Now, what does it mean, though? Excuse me. What does it mean, though, that we have been justified by grace and we have been set free what does it mean that we've been set free well number one there, the first thing here is that in christ there is an answer to the law in christ there is an answer to the law that answer of course is grace now think about how demanding the law was what does paul say here i testify uh, to again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law that's pretty demanding if you keep one part of the law to justify yourself, you have to keep the whole law. And even at that, it won't justify you. I think this is one of the most misunderstood aspects of Jesus' teaching. I see this more and more as you go through Jesus' teaching. I used an example last week from the Sermon on the Mount. That the Sermon on the Mount is not this flowery sermon that we should all try to strive to live up to. It's, it's not that there's not things in there that we can strive to live up to, but that's not the main goal. The main goal of the Sermon on the Mount is, look how demanding the law is and how necessary the cross is at the same time. The law is demanding and the cross, the gospel is so necessary. Here's one example. Look at this from the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. 
For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So Jesus ends this message kind of like Paul. Basically, the law demands perfection. If you're going to keep the law, you know, you get, you're obligated to keep the whole law. And he says here, you, you have to keep it perfectly. The law demands perfection. But what else does Jesus say? I think this is fascinating. Kind of a little, sounds a little quid pro quo here in verse, in verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies so that you may be. It's kind of like, if you do this for me, well, I'll do this for you. If you love your enemies then I'll let you be my son or daughter. A little quid pro quo. It sounds a little bit like the law. But even if you take that aspect out, if you take that kind of quid pro quo nature out of the verse there, you've got this idea that you need to always love your enemies, no exceptions. That's the demands of the law. You have to always love your enemies. And what does he end with? Well, you have to be perfect, like your Father in heaven is perfect. I was thinking about that reality this week. So I can tell you that, you know, there is times in my life when I have loved my enemies. There's times in life when I have prayed for some of my enemies. But I can tell you that I have not loved every one of my enemies 100% of the time perfectly. (laughs) And I can tell you that I've never gone to the cross for my enemies. But that's what Christ did. And so Christ comes along and Christ fulfills the law perfectly for us. And so the point of the Sermon on the Mount is this is how demanding the law is. The law is demanding. The cross is necessary. You see, while the law demanded perfection, the cross welcomes us as sinners. While the law demanded 100% from us, the cross asks nothing from us. The cross welcomes those who are not perfect because Christ was. So the first thing we see being set free means there is an answer to the law, and that's grace. Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We are standing in God's grace. It is the answer to the law. And one other thing here, Before we go on, this is really fascinating because here's what God has done. Today, instead of me forgiving my enemies, watch this, because the law demands that I forgive my enemies. You know why why I forgive my enemies today? Because I want to. Because God gave me a new heart and he gave me his spirit and he gave me the desire to actually be Christ and forgive my enemies. Doesn't mean I always do it like I should. But you know what? Let Let me ask it this way. And this might not apply to all of it. It depends when you were saved. But, but think about this. Was it easier to forgive your enemies before you were saved or after you were saved? Ask most people. They're going to say, after I was saved, after I had Christ, it was a lot easier to forgive my enemies. That's the point. The law demands. Grace answers this demands of the law. Gives us the desires of our heart. Uh, the second thing we could say here is this. Uh, there, in Christ, there is freedom from. There is freedom from. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. There's freedom from, we could put a number of things on there. We're freedom from the law, of course. But a great verse we look at all the time. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free, has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Being free means there is a freedom from. And here's a whole host of things that we are free from. Religion. Religion, which is basically man's attempt to reach God. We don't have to try to reach God, right? Because God has reached down to us. There's the law, of course. We're free from the law. Trying to be justified by our own good works. We're free from sin and pride and the flesh and condemnation and guilt and shame and fears and angers and doubts and insecurities and uh, our past, the opinions of others, the approval of others, the expectations of others. We have been set free from and I wonder this morning what you would put on that blank 
We can all write our own thing on that blank. I, have been set, I need to be reminded this morning that I have been set free from. And what would you put on that blank, each one of us personally this morning? So there's an answer to and there's a freedom from and then thirdly there is a hope for. There is a hope for tomorrow. And I love, what, I love verse 5 here. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly await for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith, working through love. And he says, we eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. What's he talking about? Well, this is the opposite of those who are what? Those are being justified by grace. These are those trying to be justified by their own good works, by the law. These are the ones that are not living in freedom versus the ones that are living in freedom. And if you're living in freedom, you are eagerly waiting for the hope of righteousness. You're eagerly waiting for what that freedom will produce in your life as you submit to it. And there's three words here. Well, let me give you this quote first. It's a great quote. This is the Enduring World Word Commentary. The word speaks of an attitude, eagerly waiting, the word speaks of an attitude of intense yearning and an eager waiting for something. Here it refers to the believer's intense desire for and eager expectation of a practical righteousness which will be constantly produced in his life by the Holy Spirit as he yields himself to him. Now watch this. Look, look at this verse in 2 Corinthians 3. There's three words here. First is the Spirit. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You realize you want to live in freedom? The more you submit to the Holy Spirit in your life, the more you're going to live in freedom. How beautiful is that? And that's the first thing that Paul says here in this verse, through the Spirit. And then he says, by faith. What is faith? Faith is our ability to see the things in the Spirit, to see the things of the Spirit, to see the unseen realities of the spiritual world and the spiritual life. It's not seen with my eyes, physical eyes. It's seen with my spiritual eyes. It's seen what God is doing that, that maybe I can't see in the outside, but I can see what what freedom is producing in me, the righteousness that is being developed in me, that is growing in me. I'm righteous in Christ. He's my righteousness. But that righteousness is being refined and shined out of my life as the years go on. And so there is the spirit, there is the faith, and then there is the hope. Because this, this gives me hope. There's a hope for tomorrow. I look at the reality of everything I'm becoming. When I am free, I am free to be all that Christ made me to be. I am free to reach my potential in Christ. I am free from the past, and I am free for the future. And we all need to know that, that where we are today in 10 years will be someplace, will be, God will take us farther in our relationship, and His righteousness will be developed in us and shine out of us in greater and greater ways. So we start with a basic premise here. First thing we see is that we have been set free. Here's the second reality today. And again, we can live in the freedom of Eden in the midst of a fallen world. So understand this next point. We can live in the freedom of Eden. We've been set free. We can live in that, in that freedom in the midst of this fallen world. So Galatians 5 tells us this. You were running well, Paul says to the Galatians. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, excuse me, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. Here's the second point. We can live free through the truth. So I've been set free through Christ and now I can live free through the truth. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? And so again, these Galatians are running well. The troublemakers come in and they create an atmosphere of confusion. Think of that word confusion. There's an atmosphere of confusion in this church. And we'll know what Paul says that, you know, a little leaven, a little sin, a little false teaching, a little compromise of the gospel and you have a mess on your hands. And that's one thing about the gospel. The gospel is incredibly, has incredible clarity for us, right? The gospel tells us where we stand with God with incredible clarity. It's an amazing thing. 
So let's consider how the truth, how the word can help set us free here, okay? First, God's word is the absolute truth. It is the absolute truth. And again, who hindered you from obeying the truth? There is an absolute truth. Know what Paul doesn't say. Paul doesn't say, well, I get it. You know, this is my truth and, and uh, that's their truth and we all have to figure out what our own truth is. Paul doesn't say truth is subjective. He says it's objective. Truth is absolute. It's authoritative. There is an absolute truth. And, and the reality, think about logically what this would look like <clears throat> if we didn't have this absolute truth. Think about how much confusion seeps in. Just look at what happens when you take the police out of a city, right, and just have at it. All the confusion and all the destruction and the police are there and they're an authority and, and they're a law and they're a... And the scriptures would make the case they're there for our good. Here, here's the reality. God, God's answer to confusion is the truth. We have confusion in our world today. You know, you could wipe out that confusion overnight if everybody would just submit to the truth found in God's word. Here it is in John chapter 8. Look at this. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Truth is a person, it's Christ ultimately, but he's found in the word. They answered him, we are the offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How, how blind they are. How is it that you say, you will become free? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And there's an absolute freedom, right? We can know this absolute freedom in Christ. We can be set free. And, Paul, and Jesus says, just like, like Paul says, you can be absolutely set free in the son. And if you abide in my word, you can live that freedom out. If you abide in me, you can live out that freedom every single day. There is an absolute truth that will clear up the confusion in our life. And let's be honest, even in the world today, those who say there's truth is subjective and not objective, that truth is relative and not absolute, that we all make our own truth up, you know, they may say that, but then, you know, they're going to be the first ones. I was thinking about this, because you, you could have someone who believes you know, that we need to make radical changes because of cl we're destroying the earth through climate, right? We're, we're radical. We, you know, we really need new policies because mankind is destroying the earth. Uh, we need climate change. Or we need to solve climate change. And if you went to that person and said, that's great, that's your truth, this is my truth, you know, how, how, how well would that, that would not set with them. They, they may believe truth is relative and subjective until you told them, well, I don't agree with that truth, so that can be your truth, and this is my truth, and all of a sudden they would expose that they, nobody really believes the reality that truth is relative or subjective. It's just what our truth is based on. That's the question, and so that, that, that climate change activist would say, well, my truth is rooted in science, and someone else has their truth rooted in, you know, whatever it might be. Our truth is what? It's rooted in God's word. It's rooted in the absolute truth of God's word. And that's just the, the reality. And then we have this one, God's word is the final authority. God's word is our final authority. In fact, what we believe from the standpoint of the Bible is that there is one absolute final authority in everything. The one who created, created and designed the planet is the authority on the planet. The one who designed marriage and relationships is the authority on marriage and relationships. The one who made us is the authority on us. The one who came up with the redemptive plan is the authority on who is saved and who isn't, who's going to heaven and who's not. If he says there is only one way, there is only one way. Go back to the Garden of Eden again. Remember in the Garden of Eden, there's those two trees and there's that one tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I've made this point before, but the greatest, <clears throat> the greatest uh, symbolism of that tree is that it represents God's authority. And the minute that Adam and Eve violated that tree and ignored God's authority is when things became a mess. 
1 Thessalonians 2.13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And they recognize the Thessalonians said the word of God, it's different than any other word. This is the word of God. And we saw last week that God's word carries a weight, a supernatural weight. It's different. Some people's word just carries more weight and God's word carries the most weight. And note that it's the word that is at work in you believers. It's at work in us. And we need to know that as we live under its authority and as we internalize the word, it will work in, a, in us and on us and through us. Here's a quick authority test when, you, when it comes to God's word. Think about this. Is there a validation that's more important than God's? Is there a person in your life that their approval is more important to you than God's approval? Anybody? If there is, that person and that relationship will at some point imprison you. Is there anything you worship more than God? And by worship we mean is there anything where you find your self-worth or your, your significance from? Or is, is um, there anything that you put your trust in or you rely on more than God? If there's anything like that, in your life, you'll eventually be imprisoned by that thing. If there's anything you worship more than God, and number three, is there anything you are pursuing more than God? Is there a behavior? Is there a hobby? Is there an addiction? Is there a habit? Is there a coping mechanism? Is there something in your life that you are pursuing more than God? That you, a mindset that you refuse to let go of? Is there anything like that? It will imprison you. You know God wants you to let go of that hurt. You're a prisoner to the pain. But you're also, you also thrive off of that victimhood of being a victim of that hurt. You know God wants you to you know, stop hiding behind this pretend mask. He wants you to, this is who I am. And yet we live with these insecurities in life. We're insecure and so we hide who we really are. You know, God wants you to give up that vice. Your whole world revolves around that vice. It has imprisoned you. But as we talked a couple weeks ago, it is your coping mechanism. It's how you cope with life. Is there something you are pursuing more than God? Something you're worshiping more than God? Something you're trusting more than God? A validation that is higher than God's? Those things will imprison you. And then finally, God's word is our personal boundaries. Here's another way to look at God's word today. Think about it this way. The Bible can give us the boundaries that will allow us to live in freedom, much like those kids on the playground. The fence gave them freedom. God's word can be the fence that gives us freedom. It can be the fence that clears up the confusion in our life. Think about it like this. God's word gives us the boundaries for our dating relationships. God's word gives us children the boundaries on respecting parents. Jamie, she talked back to her mom one few too many times and so Jamie got grounded for two weeks and she missed a, a great birthday party at her friends and a big school event for the year. And as she sat at home in her room, she felt like a prisoner. God's word gives us all the boundaries of how to respect authority. God's word gives us boundaries on how to handle money. Joe went out and bought a car he couldn't afford on credit he didn't have. The payments ate up so much of his check and literally he literally had nothing left after paying his most basic bills and he sat home every weekend and he felt like a prisoner to that car. And God's word gives us the boundaries on how to handle money. Gives us boundaries for our mouth, what we should and shouldn't say. You ever get in trouble with your mouth? And God's word can be the boundaries to say, hey, don't say that. It's the boundaries on our behavior. These are the boundaries that we have the freedom to violate, and yet they are the boundaries that allow for a life of freedom. And that's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden again. There's a tree there. It's the boundaries. Just don't go to that tree. They had the freedom to go to it. They had the free will to go to it. When they went to it, they were no longer free. When they violated the boundaries God had set up for them in the garden, they were imprisoned to their doubts and their fears and their sins. They lost their freedom. In his TED Talk, The Paradox of Choice, secular psychologist Barry Schwartz claims that many of us live by this unspoken but official dogma, maximize your happiness by maximizing your individual freedom. And according to Schwartz, the way to maximize freedom is to maximize choice. 
Schwartz points to his local supermarket as an example, a place that offers 175 different kinds of salad dressings. Even our personal identity has become a matter of choice. We don't inherit an I- <clears throat> we don't in- <clears throat> we don't inherit an identity. He says we get to invent it, and we get to reinvent ourselves as often as we like. And that means that every day when you wake up in the morning, you have to decide what kind of person you want to be. Schwartz ended his talk by pointing to a picture of two fish in a fishbowl. <clears throat> As he said, the, tr- the truth of the matter is that if you shatter the fishbowl so that everything is possible, you don't have freedom. You have paralysis. If you shatter this fishbowl so that everything is possible, you decrease satisfaction. Everybody needs a fishbowl. The absence of some metaphorical fishbowl is a recipe for misery and I suspect disaster. And in some ways, God's word is kind of like, yeah, maybe. In some ways, God's word is kind of like our fishbowl. It sets up boundaries so that we can truly know the freedom in this world. So we have been set free and we can live free through the truth and Again, we can live in the freedom of Eden. In the midst of a fallen world, we can live in the freedom because there is an authority and there are boundaries that God has given to us to live in freedom. Finally, the last few verses here. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not accept, use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another our opportunity our freedom is an opportunity to serve our freedom is an opportunity to serve again the troublemakers came into the church created this atmosphere and and what they did was they brought in probably this arguing and this this um this disagreement and this fighting and so paul goes on to deal with this issue Paul's point here is not to contradict anything he said previous. The truth is authoritative and the gospel is absolute. Yet the freedom it brings does come with a responsibility. He is not saying they should accept anything less than the word of truth and the gospel of grace. What he is saying is that truth and grace should influence how we treat each other. So Paul says here, you know, first thing, do not use your freedom for the flesh. And we talked about the flesh a couple of weeks back, right? We talked about the flesh. We defined it as hedonism, pleasure, and humanism, self, and culturalism. You know, the lies of this world and idolism, those coping mechanisms. And basically, don't use your flesh. And don't use your freedom, I should say. Don't use your freedom to cope in the flesh. And don't use your your freedom for pleasure and for self and to fit in. Don't use your... Don't use your freedom for those reasons. Use your freedom, Paul says, to serve. Use your freedoms to live free as you learn to serve others and to be a servant of others. In fact, here's what Paul tells us. Look at this, a couple examples here. Ephesians 3.1, Paul says this about himself. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. Philippians, uh, Philemon 1.9, again, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also of Christ Jesus. Sometimes he uses the word servant or slave. What's Paul doing here? Well, look at Titus 3.3. 3. No, don't look at Titus. Look at Titus 3.3. 3. <laughs> For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. And so here's the point Paul's making. You, can, you have a choice. You can be a slave of your flesh, of hedonism and humanism and culturalism and idolism. You can be a slave of your flesh or you can be a slave of Christ. You're going to be a slave of one or the other. So Who do you want to be a slave of? And when you are saved, Paul says, I was saved, so I became a prisoner of Christ, and I, you know, I I became a slave of righteousness. This is who I am in Christ. This is my reality. But how are we living our life? And here's the amazing thing, that when you become a slave of Christ, when you choose to live as a prisoner of Christ and live in your freedom in Christ in that sense, here's the amazing thing. You know, we always, always talk about the paradoxical nature of God's kingdom, right? 
where the weak are strong and the poor are rich. The foolish are considered wise where you lose your life, then you find it. Well, here's the great reality. When you live as a prisoner of Jesus Christ, what happens? You find your freedom. You can be a slave of the flesh or you can be a slave of Christ. That's the reality. But the truth is, is that being a slave of Christ will set you free. Adam and Eve in the garden, when they lived under the authority there in the garden, they were free. If we live under the authority of God's word, if, if we live as a prisoner of Christ, we will know freedom. The freedom that God always intended we live in, the perfect righteousness of Eden, we can know that spiritually today in the midst of this fallen world. We can desire the righteousness. We are set free to live free. That's the reality. You can live for all of these other things over here and as a slave to all of these things or you can live as a slave to Christ. One thing Christ and he will set you free. Now what Christ shows us here is that there's this sense where we are set free to serve and the greatest example of someone using their freedom to serve, the greatest example ever of that is what? It is of course the cross. Because at the cross, Christ went to the cross and demonstrated what it looks like to, to use your freedom to serve someone else. In fact, I think it's pretty fascinating to think about this. The cross allowed God to live in his own freedom. Because, because of the cross, Christ forgave us and he let go. He dealt with his anger and wrath so he could live in his own freedom. It's, it's a picture for you and I today that when we forgive someone, when we serve someone, when we let go, we can live in freedom. And the, the amazing reality about this is when was Christ crucified? The Bible tells us Christ was crucified before the foundation of the earth. Uh, it, it, it may be in this way that, that, that before Adam and Eve ever were, God had said, I am going to send a redeemer. The redemptive plan was in motion before anything was ever created. God had plans. I think it's just who God's character is to forgive. It's just who he is. There's no other way that he can live. And so what that means is that even in the Old Testament, even, even as Adam and Eve are taking that bite of apple from the tree, God is forgiving them. The, the means of forgiveness, the cross is already in motion. And God can live in freedom. And we can live in freedom when we surrender to Christ, when we live under his authority, when we learn to serve others, when we learn to forgive others. We can live. That incredible freedom. Let's, let's leave here with 13 and 14. Final two verses, 13 and 14. But through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And it's kind of fascinating here that love is used two, two times. And in one time it's almost like the noun, right? Look at that verse. Through love, serve one another. What's the noun there? Well, the noun, is, the verb is to serve. What's the noun? The noun would really be love. Through, through love, <coughs> serve one another. And then he says the whole law is fulfilled in one word. That word would be love. It's, it's fulfilled in love. You shall love your neighbor and their love is the verb. And it's kind of almost like this. Love is a noun and a verb. Love is our identity in Christ and then it's that identity in action. I've been set free so I can love. Love is my identity. It's who I am in Christ. And it's Christ in action when I choose to serve others, when I choose to love others. What a beautiful, what a beautiful reality. You could say it like this. Living in my freedom in Christ is living out my identity in Christ. That's the goal of our life, that we would live out who we are in Christ every single day. And when I live in the freedom I have in Christ, I'm living out the identity of Christ. I'm living out Christ. And the reality is I can know the freedom of Eden in the midst of this, in the midst of this fallen world. Go back to the Garden of Eden again. I'll leave you with this. There's those two trees, right? There's the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I'm reminded when Jesus came in the book of John, it says that, that we beheld him and he was full of grace and truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. 
And I thought, what do we need to live in freedom today? We need Christ, but we need grace and truth. And what do you have in the Garden of Eden? You have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the authority of God, the truth of God. Don't violate this authority. Respect this authority. And then over here, you have what? You have the tree of life. You have God's grace, His unmerited, undeserved kindness. Everything they needed to live in freedom was right there in the Garden of Eden. The tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the grace and the truth that will set you free. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the freedom we have in you, the freedom that we can experience in a world even when we feel like our freedoms are threatened. And that's the beauty, that's the beautiful reality of this message that we would know that freedom, that we would serve with that freedom, that we would find people that, 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 that maybe irritate us or or upset us and we would love them we have the freedom to love them we have the freedom to serve them we would know the reality of your freedom in the midst of this fallen world in jesus name amen and there are some great questions to walk through to unpack this this week who can you go out this week and serve